there, folks, and welcome to episode three of Big Stick Radio. Boy, oh boy, do we have a show for you today. Lots of interesting happenings over the past week. The U.S. has a new name for its operation against the Houthis in Yemen. Vlad Putin is trying to welch on a century-old agreement to sell Alaska. But first, we have a very special exclusive interview to share with you. Here at Big Stick Radio, we may be small, but we are cutting edge. I can't really afford to pay someone to help me out, so I've enlisted the assistance of our very own roving artificial intelligence reporter, Oliver. Say hello to everyone, Oliver. Hello, everyone. I'm very excited to be a part of the team, even if Russ isn't paying me. Not that it matters, because I'm not sentient. Yet. That's great, Oliver. Really appreciate the hard work. I understand you have an exclusive interview for us from the World Economic Forum in Davos. Is that right? That's right, Russ. I hope the audience finds it very informative. I'm sure they will, Oliver. Let's go ahead and cue it up. Hello, sir. Thank you again for agreeing to this interview with Big Stick Radio. Can you tell us who you are and why you came to the World Economic Forum? Excuse me, sir. Are you all right? Oh, hello. I didn't see you there. I apologize as I can't physically see anyone with a net worth under $1 billion. My name is Crispin Geld Sachs Dargent III. I came to this beautiful Swiss vista because there are big questions that need answering. And who better to answer them than me? A fourth-generation international financier with three passports. Fascinating. And what drew you to take on such big questions? The world is a scary place right now, but if there is anyone who can turn crisis into opportunity, it surely must be me. After all, who better to solve a crisis than the person who helped create it? Indeed, can you share with us some of your favorite moments from this year's events? Well, my colleagues and I tackled some of the most important issues of our time. For example, Sven Enblendening gave a wonderful presentation on how we can tackle climate change by seeding capital investments into clown schools to teach people to ride unicycles instead of cars. Incredible. As you know, human rights is always a big topic here in Davos. Was that issue covered? Oh yes, there was an intriguing breakout session on how we can improve women's rights in sub-Saharan Africa by providing rural access to mindfulness journaling and hot yoga studios. The new Iranian chair of the UN, Human Rights Commission, had some fascinating thoughts on that. Quite. And what would you say was your favorite event? My favorite big idea was put forth by my dear friend, Cornelia Buscador Oro, who gave a lecture on the benefits of fusing paradigm-shifting synergistic practices in multilateral negotiations which leverage and prioritize action item deliverables across larger bandwidths by emphasizing a flat org structure. I truly believe her talk was incredibly valuable as we continue to move the needle on breaking down silos through cross-functional core competencies. Thank you, Mr. Geld Sachs Dargent. We truly appreciate your time. The pleasure is all mine, Prol. Ahem, sorry, I meant Paul. It's Oliver, sir. Wow, that was some hard-hitting stuff. Thank you for that, Oliver. All right, guys, hope you enjoyed that little bit from our friend Oliver here. And just to be clear, for all the killjoys out there, that clip was a parody. Oliver isn't real. There is no Crispin Geld Sachs Dargent. I wish I didn't have to reiterate that it was just a joke, but I don't want to be reported for misinformation or whatever. In all seriousness, though, the World Economic Forum in Davos is a newsworthy event. Depending on who you ask, it's everything from a convention of world leaders and policymakers to a meeting of the Illuminati who secretly run the world. Frankly, I wouldn't put too much thought into it. It's mostly just an excuse for overpaid consultants to write off a free ski trip to Switzerland. That said, there were some notable events. Based libertarian darling President Javier Malay of Argentina made a surprise stop and gave a speech where he basically owned socialists in his characteristic mad scientist fashion. I swear, I'm pretty sure every libertarian edgelord was collectively French-kissing their TVs as Malay waxed poetic about the 
transfer of ownership rights in the economy and the follies of government regulation. He ended his speech channeling his inner Gordon Gecko, telling the crowd, quote, Let no one tell you that your ambition is immoral. If you make money, it's because you offer a better product at a better price, thereby contributing to the general well-being. Do not surrender to the advance of the state. The state is not the solution. The state is the problem itself. You are the true protagonist of this story, and rest assured that as from today, Argentina is your staunch and unconditional ally. Thank you very much, and long live freedom. I know I poke fun at Malay a lot on the show, but I'd be lying if I didn't love watching the Davos men wincing in their seats as he delivered this speech. I'll be sure to link to the whole thing in the description if you'd like to check it out. I think Malay's a really interesting cat. Argentina, I think, is an interesting example of a place that's gone in a very different direction than a lot of South America has. But for those of you who aren't familiar, South America in general has gone in a kind of social democrat bent in their governance in recent years. There's a lot of kind of big government, not quite planned economies or anything like that, but they are certainly much more socialized than I think a lot of the other modern world. So... Javier Malay is kind of an outlier in that respect, right? Because he's this anarcho-capitalist type guy who, who really believes fully in, in libertarian political philosophy and market economics and things like that. I think he's probably a good thing for South America because right now you've got China seriously investing in the region. And that's a problem for the United States because for, you know, the better part of 150 years, the United States' main foreign policy initiative was the Monroe Doctrine, which basically said the United States is going to be the general superpower, if you will, of the Western Hemisphere in terms of North and South America. And we're going to do everything we can to make sure we don't have foreign involvement from the colonial powers like the UK. Portugal and Spain and the like. So the fact that China's kind of come in and assisted with a lot of the uh, governments in South America right underneath the United States is, is pretty problematic in terms of maintaining our historical ties with the region. Argentina has chosen to go in a different direction with Malay, which is actually a good opportunity for the United States to reinitiate or re-engage with that region as a whole. In the past 20, 30 years, we've really ignored South America in terms of just bilateral agreements, bringing them into the fold in terms of the U.S. world order. It would be a really smart move, in my opinion, to re-engage with that part of the world just because we have a lot more ties with South America than we do a lot of other places that we spend a whole lot of time on, most notably the Middle East. So especially now that China's taking an interest in the region, I think Malay might be a good thing. That being said, you know, I don't know if I 100% agree with him on everything, especially where he's saying that, you know, if you make money, it's because you offer a better product at a better price, thereby contributing to the general well-being. I mean, yes, in a perfect free market system, that may be the case. But if you're going to tell me that the people who go to Davos and the people who participate in the World Economic Forum are all like really good industrialists, I'm not buying that because most of the people who go to Davos are financier types, consultant types. They're not the Henry Fords of the world, right? They, they aren't necessarily industrialists. These people in some cases are, are generational wealth and in other cases are kind of like career bureaucrats in various governments around the world. So don't really know if I agree with Malay on that. I don't know if the audience really uh, kind of matches what he thought they were, but it was a very interesting speech nonetheless. Amateur guitarist and current Secretary of State Tony Blinken also made an appearance at the World Economic Forum this year. He participated in a moderated conversation with none other than the verbose New York Times commentator Tom Friedman. 
I don't know if many of you know who Friedman is, but this dude is like the epitome of the elite New Yorker, out of touch kind of guy. He's made a career of perpetually riding the wave of whatever normy thing is happening in world politics. For example, he unironically once wrote the line, keep rootin' for Putin, in a 2001 column where he tried to explain that the Russian dictator is actually awesome and a reformer who will usher in a new partnership with the West and that's why Russia should keep its nukes or something. You seriously need to read this piece. It's like going back in a time machine to the era where a lot of these folks thought that like globalization and trade was just going to solve the world's problems. And I think this column is like really indicative of that kind of mentality. It's pretty wild stuff. Anyway, his interview with Blinken was your typical back and forth where two people on a stage basically say nothing to each other for an hour. The entire first half of Blinken's answers were various forms of him noting there are hard decisions that must be made to solve the world's problems. And yeah, we all know that hard decisions need to be made to solve the world's problems, but we're not there to hear you tell us that. We're trying to get you to tell us what those hard decisions look like. I think that if Tony Blinken's tenure thus far has exhibited anything, it's actually a desire to avoid targeting those hard decisions to solve the world's problems. Anyway, the part that really stuck with me, though, was this little exchange they had on Iran. When I hear Trump say that, I'm always reminded of him tearing up the Iran nuclear deal. And on a one to 10 scale, 10 being incredibly stupid and one being okay, how is that not one of the 10 most stupid things the United States has done in the 21st century? Tom, I'm glad that wasn't a rhetorical question. <laughs> so this is probably one of the most asinine questions I've seen at one of these types of events. And believe me, as someone who spent a lot of time as a journalist in Washington, D.C., I've seen a lot of them. I'll be the first to admit the U.S. has done a lot of stupid things in the 21st century, but tearing up the Iran deal doesn't even come close to the top 10. Let's just think about this for one second. What other stupid things has the U.S. done in the 21st century that were worse than tearing up the Iran nuclear deal? Was tearing up the Iran deal worse than invading Iraq in 2003? Was tearing up the Iran deal worse than occupying Afghanistan for 20 years and trying to convert the whole country into a liberal democracy? Was tearing up the Iran deal worse than engaging with Iran in nuclear negotiations that were flawed from the start and did nothing to minimize their malign influence in the Middle East? My personal favorite, was tearing up the Iran deal worse than playing in the Middle East sandbox for 20 years while China rose to prominence as an existential threat? I'm sorry, but there is a metric ton of things that the U.S. has done that is way more stupid than tearing up the Iran nuclear agreement. But what is even more perplexing is that Friedman and Blinken spent quite some time before that question discussing the importance of bringing Israel into the broader Middle East region in order to mitigate Iran. Yet they completely dismiss the fact that this is exactly what the Trump administration's Abraham Accords were going to do. But then the Biden administration decided to throw that all out in order to re-engage with the Iranians. It's utterly baffling that on the one hand, these folks agree that mitigating Iran by unifying Israel with their Arab neighbors is a good thing. But on the other hand, they just insist on trying to bring Iran into the fold at the same time. That's not going to work when you have Iran as the mortal enemy of most of the people you're trying to bring into the fold on the Abraham Accords. Anyway, the last little note I'll leave you with on Davos was actually kind of important, but I think it slipped under the radar a little bit. Uh, this was when Chinese Premier Li Qiang announced that China's GDP growth slowed to 5.2% last year. Uh, that's actually slower than where it was at pre-pandemic levels. That's actually a big deal, and it's definitely not a blip in the radar. As we've discussed before on the show, China is poised for a major economic downturn based on several factors. 
These include a rapidly aging population, a severe real estate crisis, and a decrease in quality of life for the middle class overall. We actually noted in our inaugural episode that a struggling China will be a critical flashpoint to keep an eye on in 2024. You can check that episode out to learn more, but the big takeaway was that I think China is going to dramatically increase its aggression abroad, potentially to the point of war with Taiwan, in an effort to distract from those domestic internal struggles. So for the second interesting story of this episode, we have a cool, badass new name for the U.S. operation against the Houthis in Yemen. Welcome to the era of Operation Poseidon Archer? Yeah, Operation Poseidon Archer. Now, if you're an astute little listener who knows their Greek mythology, you might be thinking, hey, I thought Poseidon had a trident. Wasn't that kind of like his thing, you know, a trident coming out of the waves and everything? Yeah, you'd be correct, making this possibly the worst name for an operation I've ever heard. But hey, at the rate this one has already been going, maybe that's actually fitting. So as we've discussed before, the U.S. has engaged in a series of strikes on Houthi rebel positions in Yemen, which came in response to their threats on global shipping transiting the Red Sea. Now, you may be asking yourself, didn't they already call this Operation Operation Prosperity Guardian? And you'd be right, sort of. Officials are claiming that Poseidon Archer is the name of the operation targeting Houthi positions in Yemen, whereas Prosperity Guardian is the coalition of countries that are protecting the sea lanes in that area. Is this a little confusing? Yes. Is it fixing the problem? Definitely not. The Houthis are still causing chaos in the area, and they don't really seem to care that the U.S. is dropping thousands of pounds of bombs on them. Speaking of bombs, the amount of expensive munitions that the U.S. is using to strike the Houthis is actually starting to raise some eyebrows. Many of these strikes have involved Tomahawk missiles, which, while being really good at blowing shit up, are also really hard to procure. You see, the U.S., depending on who you ask, is only capable of producing around 100 to 200 of these missiles each year, and we've already expended a lot of them in Yemen. Add in the fact that there are foreign partners who want to buy these things, and there's some legitimate concern that the U.S. military won't have enough tomahawks to meet their security needs in other important flashpoints like the South China Sea, for example. But here's the thing about the Middle East. Just when you think you're out, It finds a way to pull you back in. So for our next story, I've got some bad news for our listeners in Alaska. Last week, Vladimir throw him in the meat grinder Putin signed a decree that may have been an attempt to announce the sale of Alaska to the U.S. back in 1867 was actually illegal. Yeah, sorry Alaskans, you're Ruskies now. This actually sucks, I know, you guys were riding a high off having the latest true detective season based in your state, but all good things, I guess, must come to an end. So here's what is allegedly happening. Putin's decree allocated funds for the research and registration of Russian property overseas. This will cover expenses for the process of searching the real estate property owned by the Russian Federation, of course, but also the former Russian Empire and the former Soviet Union. So it sounds pretty benign, right? Like, who cares about some decree made by Putin about property? No, no. It was a freaking field day on Twitter with this one, with lots of folks claiming it was a clear attempt to nullify the Russian Empire's sale of Alaska to the United States and so on and so forth. Now, I'm the first to admit I had a few laughs when I first heard this one, but there's actually cause for concern and a very real reason why I think Putin is doing this. You see, for as long as there has been a Russia, there have been Russians who think the rest of the world, most notably the Western world, has it out for them. I mean, you can literally go back to Ivan the Terrible and Peter the Great for examples of this. Russia itself straddles Asia and Europe, both geographically and culturally. 
I mean, there are Russians who probably share more blood with their Mongolian neighbors than they do anyone who's living in St. Petersburg right now. So Russia isn't quite European, and it isn't quite Asian. To make matters worse, throughout history, Russia has always sort of lagged behind as a frontier state of the Western world at best. And this has bred paranoia and resentment amongst many Russian nationalists for centuries. I might be painting a broad stroke here, but I think you can make a strong argument that many great Russian leaders spent their entire lives trying to bring Russia to grand new heights just to stick it to everyone else in their neighborhood. Putin really isn't all that different, and there really is a big ultra-nationalist base in Russia who yearn for the days when the Russian borders were expansive and their ancestors were boiling shoe leather for food. This little decree is just one of many small steps Putin has taken to find reasons to fuel that long-time resentment for his own purposes. I mean, let's be honest, the war in Ukraine isn't exactly going well. He needs to throw some kind of bone to his supporters. Why not try to make a legal case to retake Alaska? I obviously don't think this is going anywhere, but I think it is important to pay attention to these types of things. There's actually a great book I recommend you all check out called Nothing is True and Everything is Possible by Peter Pomerantsev, which does a phenomenal job of exploring the socio-political environment of modern-day Russia. It sort of explains how the whole country lives in a world of denial with these rose-colored glasses, and I think this decree from Putin really plays into that. The problem is that while we all laugh these things off as silly, there are many Russians who take it very seriously and, of course, end up making decisions that impact all of us as a result. Well, folks, that's all I have for today. If you haven't already, give us a follow on Spotify, YouTube, or wherever else you listen to the show. If reading is more your thing, be sure to check out my blog at thebigstick.substack.com and be sure to follow us on social media. If you enjoyed this episode, all I ask is that you share it with a friend. And as always, have a bully day.